Good evening, dear colleagues. Good evening, friends. So it's Wednesday evening, and welcome to another EAG webinar. We are very glad to host you, and we hope that you enjoy again uh, our this activity. Uh, today, our topic is about endoscopic management on non ovaricial upper exceptional panels with us. So as you already know, it's, it is the third consecutive year that EG offers you this opportunity, the opportunity to view high quality presentation on the hottest topics uh, from endoscopy uh, and that the, the presentation are delivered from world leaders in endoscopy. And you have the uh, chance to interact with the speakers and to participate by submitting online your question. So you can use uh, your uh, Q&A function in, in the Zoom facility uh, to post your question. And most of all, this activity, this EAG activity is still free of charge. And as I said, uh, we have uh, exceptional panelists, uh, have no disclosure on this activity. And so we have two uh, excellent panelists, I mean, the first one is uh, Professor Ian Granlek, our general secretary general, is coming from Haifa, Israel, is one of the top experts and leading expert in GI bleeding. He has, uh, he's the first author of uh, not only the very active on the field, and so we have also with us uh, Dr. Marine Camus from Paris, France. Uh, another expert, and we will, who, for which we are very glad to have it with us. And now it's time to start. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Ian Glanek. Ian, uh, welcome. Nice being again with us. You have been uh, participating in a lot of webinars so far. And Ian, the microphone is yours. Uh, Costas, good evening. I hope you can hear me. Okay, good evening, everybody. I want to thank the ESG for inviting me to be one of the experts here. Uh, I think this is a, a topic that all of us deal with. It's always a uh, sought after topic at uh, conferences. So I'm very happy to be able to uh, discuss this here tonight. These are my disclosures. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna do this as a case-based presentation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this case. I'm gonna show you a bunch of different videos though from different patients. So this is a pretty classic case. 78 year old gentleman comes in the emergency department. He has a history of coronary artery disease. He had a coronary stent placed about seven years ago. He has hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. He uses low dose aspirin on a daily basis because of cardiac history. And he comes in because he's had several episodes of melanoma over the past 24 hours. He's slightly tachycardic. His blood pressure systolic is, is 99 when he's, when he's laying down. Uh, initial hemoglobin is 9.1, but his baseline is 14.1. Now, what I really like to do is I really think of the approach to uh, acute upper GI bleeding as what, do I, what should I be thinking about before I do endoscopy? We'll talk about what we should be doing and thinking about during endoscopy, and then also what should we be considering after endoscopy? So if we talk about pre-endoscopy management, there are a number of, of things. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail just because of the limited time we have. So we need to first, of course, be thinking about hemodynamic resuscitation initially with crystalloids fluids. Today, the recommendations are to use a restrictive blood transfusion policy. So less blood is probably beneficial uh, depending on what the hemoglobin level is. Um, we want to consider using an IV PPI potentially starting in the emergency department because there's been some data that shows that this may be beneficial in terms of uh, having less um, a significant uh, endoscopic stigmata at the time of endoscopy. We want to always make sure about what, if, if they're using antithrombotics or anticoagulants. Uh, I've talked in this patient, he uses once a day low dose uh, aspirin. So he's on an antiplatelet medication. We need to think what we do with those types of medications. Do we hold them? Do we continue them? Do we use a promotility agent? Uh, if we're concerned about that there's blood or clots in the, in the stomach, are we gonna give a promotility agent such as IV erythromycin before we do endoscopy? 
And lastly, what's the timing of endoscopy? Really the general recommendation today in most all patients is that from the time they present, we should be doing upper endoscopy within 24 hours. Sooner endoscopy, so like really emergent endoscopy has not been shown to improve outcomes and actually can be detrimental to the patients. Okay, so um, this patient ended up getting scoped. And what you're gonna see here, we're in the stomach. You can see that there's some fresh blood. And if you look on the left side, right in the antrum uh, here, right, really in the prepyloric area. So this is a forest 1A lesion. This patient actually has spurting bleeding. Video is running a little bit slow, but there is some spurting bleeding that's there. Okay. And what we're gonna see here in this other video is that what we wanna do, combination endoscopic therapy is recommended. You see there's an ulcer there, there's some active bleeding. And first we're gonna inject around this area with dilute epinephrine. And, we, and, and so it's, it's really one to 10,000 epinephrine. You wanna inject one to two cc's right around the bleeding area, ideally in like the four quadrants around. That's gonna slow down the bleeding or potentially even stop the bleeding. It's gonna allow when there's active bleeding like that, it can sometimes be difficult to visualize where it's coming from. And then a clip can be placed on it. Now, for whatever reason, we, we lost the video with the clip here, but you can then place a clip on there. You can as, either use thermal therapy or you can use mechanical therapy, such as a through the scope clip, or potentially even now being coming uh, more common is a cap mounted clip, like a over the scope uh, clip. Okay, let's go to the next. This is another example. This is also, the slides are, the videos are moving very slow for whatever reason. But anyhow, this is a, uh, actually an astomotic ulceration. There was active oozing here. And you can see that there had been a previous, uh, this looks like it's probably from the previous surgery that's there, but there's oozing coming from here. Um, if there's just a little bit of oozing, you can visualize the area. You actually may not need to put any dilute epinephrine around there. And you can actually just go right ahead here, like what we're doing here. And you can just put a through the scope clip right on the site of bleeding. This causes mechanical compression and the bleeding is able to be stopped. Okay, and you see it's no longer oozing. Okay, just like that. This is another one. This is sort of old school. Hopefully this is gonna run a little bit faster. So what we see here, this is a gastric ulceration. You can actually see the ulcer crater. And this is also, again, a spurting bleeder. And what we're gonna do here initially, this is really the situation where you really need to use combination therapy, you're gonna pre-inject here with dilute epinephrine. Again, one to two cc's per injection around the area here, around the, the, uh, the ulceration. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna slow down the bleeding. It's still bleeding, but not nearly as fast as it was. And in this situation, we're gonna use contact thermal therapy. This is a large size, a 10 French gold probe. So it's a bipolar probe that we're using. We're gonna push on this area, coaptive coagulation, where you're actually gonna weld that vessel closed. You're gonna actually see the bubbling there just from the, uh, from the uh, thermal therapy that we're using. You're actually gonna create even more damage. You're gonna increase the size of the ulceration, but we hopefully will have closed that vessel because we're putting pressure on there and we're sealing the vessel shut at the site of bleeding. Let me show you something else. This is, shows you how important it is can be able to use the dilute epinephrine. This is another uh, actively bleeding gastric. It's gonna be an ulcer, but at this point you can't even tell. You don't know if this is a Dulaflaz lesion or if there's an ulceration there because it's spurting so much. So again, here, what you're gonna to wanna to do is use combination therapy because you wanna get control of the bleeding to be able to visualize what's there. And now what you're gonna see, we're injecting the epinephrine around here. It's already started to slow down the active bleeding. And what I wanna show you is now all of a sudden you can see that there really is an ulcer that's there, okay? You see the ulcer very nicely now that we've cleaned it up, there's no more active bleeding and you can treat this time here with a through the scope uh, clip to close this area. Okay, I, I told you that more and more uh, cap, what I like to call cap mounted clips. So 
uh, over the scope clips or the padlock clip. These are the two large clips or clamps that are now available are becoming uh, used more and more because we have increasing data. In fact, there's gonna be a really now the first uh, randomized controlled trial. It's gonna be published in the coming months in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology by Jensen and the UCLA group, actually looking at the use of a cat mounted clip as primary or first line therapy in patients who have uh, uh, bleeding ulcerations and Dulafoz lesions. What we're gonna see here on the left is this is actually, again, an actively bleeding lesion here, pre-pyloric. It's, it's sort of what I call pulsatile, not spurting. So actually, injection was not even used here, but the cap is placed. This is very much like a band ligator. The plastic cap, and you see the, you see the uh, bear claw that's attached to the, clap is put, uh, to the cap is put right over the bleeding site. And then it can either be suctioned into the, into the uh, cap like it is here, or in some cases, if it's fibrotic, there's actually a grasper that you can put through and actually grasp the tissue and pull it back into the cap and then release the, uh, release the uh, clip on there. And there's what you see afterwards. The, the clip has been placed over this bleeding site and there's actually no bleeding. It, it is able to grab a large amount of tissue, tissue and mechanically press the vasculature close. Okay, let me show you something else. This is from my colleague who you're gonna hear momentarily, Dr. Marine Camus. This was a very recent case. This was a duodenal ulceration, which continued to bleed despite use of uh, through the scope clips. I think you can see the clips there. Now, epinephrine is being injected here but there's still some active bleeding that's going on here. The other thing I want you to notice here in these types of lesions, this is a large fibrotic lesion, which you really want to consider using a cat mounted clip in these types of situations. And momentarily, we're going to see this is exactly what uh, uh, Marine decided to do. Although Marine, you had told me that you actually had to pull these through the scope clips off first to open up the area, but we see there's still ongoing uh, oozing that's here. And this is a really nice demonstration of the over the scope clip. It's very much like a band ligating device. You see that the, uh, the flywheel has been attached to the scope there. This is the yellow that you're seeing here. And then just like with a band ligating device, the, um, uh, it, you, it, it, you go through the working channel of the scope. And what we're gonna see here is we're gonna grab on, it's just like a fishing, fishing string or a fishing wire that's gonna get hooked on there. You're gonna draw the cap back and then you're gonna attach it here to the end of the scope. And the clip is located on that cap. You pull this back again, just like a, a, a variceal band ligating device. And Dr. Kimu is going to attach that here, wind it up. And then now she's gonna go back here to this very large fibrotic ulcer. She's gonna find where this, this, the actual site of bleeding is. It's still actually, despite the epinephrine, appears to be having some bleeding here. And now she's gonna suction this site up of the actual bleeding point into the clear plastic uh, cap. And then she's gonna release using that yellow flywheel, she's gonna release this uh, over the scope clip onto the bleeding site, which we'll see here momentarily. You see there now that the clip has been released. Now we're gonna get a better shot here at the end. And you're gonna see that the bleeding has completely stopped. So for these large lesions, these large ulcers that are fibrotic, where our other treatments may be very difficult to use, cap, cap uh, clips, cap mounted clips can be very, very uh, effective. And you see the clip that's, that's on here. And now there's, act there's no more bleeding. It was a very nice case and uh, I'm very happy and glad that she shared that with me. Let's go on. I wanna show you one more here. I think this may be the last video. This is also a device. Um, this is actually a, a hemograsper that you're gonna see here, there's this small site of uh, bleeding. So this is a hemostatic forceps. These are becoming more popularly used with third space endoscopy, but people are, there have been some now studies that have looked at this for use in, in non variceal upper GI bleeding. The actual point of, of bleeding is grasp. 
you can sort of tent it back, you can pull back just a little bit, and then you can deliver the uh, soft coagulation and the bleeding stops in this case. I uh, uh, have rarely used this, but uh, we may see this more and more being used in, in treating non variceal upper GI bleeding. Always be careful. Uh, what you see here, that this is a, a large ulceration in the stomach. There is a non-bleeding visible vessel right here. We're in retroflexion. You see the scope here, and this is a 10 French gold probe. One of my colleagues was doing this case, and uh, it was not pre-injected with epinephrine around here. And the probe touched this non-bleeding visible vessel, and it started to bleed. As you can see, there's torrential bleeding here. And the first rule in this situation is take a deep breath and stay calm. What you wanna do in this situation, you see it's still, there's pulsatile arterial bleeding here. We've already, in, you didn't see that, but we injected uh, with uh, dilute epinephrine and it actually has slowed down this bleeding. It's not nearly as torrential. So we've slowed the bleeding down and we're gonna actually use that same 10 French bipolar probe, the gold probe. We're gonna put pressure here, coaptive coagulation. We're gonna use low wattage, anywhere from about 10 watts to 18 watts. And we're gonna hold that position from eight to 10 seconds, giving that low wattage. And we're gonna be able to weld that vessel closed. It, can, it still continues to bleed a little bit here. So we're gonna use another tamponade station. We're gonna push on this area. So we're making sure that we're opposing the site of the bleeding. And now we finally have got it to stop. We're gonna wash this area and watch it. Make sure it doesn't start to reuse, but we've now sealed that close. So this is what I mean by coaptive coagulation used in a thermal probe. This is a forest 2A lesion or a non-bleeding visible vessel. You see this protuberance here in the ulcer base. What you wanna be able to do with that probe is push down here. You're gonna hold that, like I said, for eight to 10 seconds, use low wattage. That's gonna seal that underlying vessel closed. And then what you're gonna have here is you're gonna have this post hemostasis footprint, okay? That's what you wanna be going for you wanna completely get rid of that protuberance that's here in that first picture. Lastly, um, if, if all else is failing, we also have topical agents that are now available like TC325 or Hemospray. There's also Endoclot. Um, there's uh, uh, Medtronic is coming out with another type of a topical spray called Next Powder. There's very limited data about that. Most of the data that we have is really on Hemospray. And what you can see here is if really none, none of our other treatments are, are working, you can use Hemospray, this topical agent, as a uh, temporizing measure to gain control. You need to have active bleeding for it to work. Um, it needs to have uh, blood and fluids that are there. Um, you want to make sure that your catheter doesn't uh, clog. So you want to make sure you dry the working channel really well before you put the catheter through the working channel. You want to disconnect your suction because it's very common for us to use the suction button and then you suction fluid and the catheter can clog. If it does get clogged, you can pull it out and you can just sort of snip off the end with a uh, scissors and continue to use the catheter. You also want to push out your catheter far enough because sometimes with these, these topical agents, sort of like a snowstorm, you get blowback of the topical agent and it obscures your view. You sort of see that down here a little bit. But what you get here is you, you see that the, the powder is being sprayed on this area and uh, is able to, uh, just by uh, absorbing the fluid and the bloods, as well as probably some type of pressure that's being put on there uh, by the powder is, is able to stop. We don't know always exactly how these uh, topical agents work. But again, these, this is a temporizing measure. They don't work quite as well with the active spurting bleeding, bleeding because it, it washes off uh, probably because of the spurting. Uh, these may stay in place, the top equations for about 12 to 24 hours. So usually we need to go back within about 24 hours to reevaluate. A warning. So epinephrine alone is inadequate uh, therapy. It's not definitive therapy. If you're gonna use dilute epinephrine, you, use it, you need to use it in combination with another hemostasis uh, agent. These are the tools really we all should have as part of our toolbox, injectables through the scope clips, contact thermal probes, hemostatic uh, uh, graspers, some type of a topical spray or powder, 
and then uh, cap mounted clips. We really should all be facile at using these and have these available within our endoscopy units. So um, if you're gonna use combination therapy, you've heard me say this, I'll go through this quickly. You wanna inject around the area of the active bleeding to get a tamponade effect and vasoconstriction. You can then use, if you're gonna use mechanical therapy in follow-up, you can use through the scope or cap mounted clip. If you're gonna use contact thermal probe, I like to use a, a large size probe. So that means you need a, to use at least a large single channel endoscope or a double channel endoscope to do these cases. With a diagnostic gastroscope, the large size probes won't fit in there. You wanna use low wattage. So anywhere from 12 to 15 or potentially 18 watts. Eight to 10 second tamponade stations with firm pressure on the bleeding site, which leads to uh, uh, welding the vessel closed. Rescue therapy can be a topical agent if needed, if there's persisting bleeding. Some other technical tips, as I've said, single channel or two channel gastroscope, make sure you have water jet capability for washing. Large size probes for the large fibrotic ulcers. I like to use cat mounted clips now today. I think they work probably the best. You can use a contact thermal probe if, if needed. Uh, rescue therapy for persistent bleeding can be topical agents or even a cat mounted uh, clip. And then really today, it, it really should be common practice that we have 24 seven coverage for emergency bleeding and that we're actually working with a nurse or an assistant who has training in endoscopy and training in, in endoscopic hemostasis, uh, that they know what they're doing, they're familiar with our scopes, they're familiar with the uh, hemostasis uh, therapies that we have in our toolbox. What do we do after endoscopy really quick? High dose uh, PPIs should be used. We can initiate clear liquids if a peptic ulcer bleeding, test and treat for HP. You need to think about their antithrombotic management. I'm gonna refer you to the ESG guidelines about that. When should we, we should be restarting. Antiplatelet agents, we should, they should be back on those agents within three to five days. If they're using dual antiplatelet therapies, that second agent usually should be back on within seven days as well. Anticoagulants also should be restarted within about seven days. If they have clinical evidence of uh, re-bleeding, we should be rescoping those patients and providing hemostasis if necessary. If that's not working, then the next move really should be for uh, transcatheter angiographic embolization or TAE if you have that available. If you don't have that available or TAE is not working, then really the last option today is a surgical intervention. Today, it's really uncommon that we need to get to that point. Most of us, I think, have very good interventional uh, radiologists who will be able to provide a therapy with TAE if endoscopy is not working. And I'll stop there, and I think I'm actually on time, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions now or later, Costas, and you're all invited to follow me on Twitter. I like to send out things about GI bleeding and other relevant GI topics. Thanks. Thank you, I am. Thank you for... A great presentation. You very clearly illustrated uh, all the uh, facilities and all the toolbox and uh, whatever we need and also the patients that we need when dealing with upper GI bleeding. And uh, yeah, your, your presentation has prompted our attendees, which uh, by the way are more than 460 so far, uh, to great. fill up questions. And we have a lot of questions, And but I, I would prefer to, to give now the microphone to uh, Dr. Marine Camus uh, from uh, Paris, France, to continue with some uh, not so common uh, causes of bleeding and how to treat them. So it's an, uh, it's our pleasure to have you, Marine, with us today. Uh, Marine is working in uh, very actively on the field of upper, but also in the lower GI bleeding. She has contributed to the literature, and it is a pleasure to welcome her for the first time in our webinar series. Maureen. Hello everyone and um, thank you Costas. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, webinar with you about endoscopic management of non-varicell upper GI bleeding. And I'm really grateful that ESG gave me the opportunity to talk with you about the rare causes of uh, non-varicell upper GI bleeding. So, uh, let's start with uh, the view of this interim. It's Madame M. Uh, she's an 86 year old woman with anemia and iron deficiency. She was referred in our endoscopic unit for a current melena and she had 
already uh, she already had a transfusion. So um, I will give you um, a question. Uh, what are these lesions? So um, it, is it uh, gastric angiodysplasia or angioectasia? Um, erythematous gastritis, du la foie, gastric enteral vascular ectasia, or cameral ulcer. So um, I think that we, you can uh, vote. Okay, so um, you are very uh, good because it's uh, Gabe or uh, yes, uh, watermelon uh, stomach. And um, so I go further. And um, you know, Gave is an unusual but interesting cause of chronic gastrointestinal blood loss and anemia. Uh, it has a unique appearance, like you can see on the photo, uh, with a spot like fashion uh, erythematous stripe from the uh, pylorus to the interim. Uh, you can have histology, but it's not necessary to uh, do the diagnosis. But if you perform biopsy, uh, you can see a particular uh, pattern with uh, fibromuscular hyperplasia of the lamina propria and intravascular fibrin thrombi and an increase in mucosal vessels. Uh, it's um, a rare cause of GI bleeding, a rare condition of unknown physiopathology. Uh, it uh, most uh, affects women and the elderly patients, and it's often uh, associated with other conditions like cirrhosis, chronic renal failure, autoimmune, and systemic disease. Uh, over or occult GI bleeding are the main symptoms, and it's sometimes a very challenging um, uh, affection and the, the treatment is, is uh, very difficult sometimes because approximately two thirds of patients are dependent on blood transfusion uh, despite transfusion iron tr uh, infusions. So uh, what it, the problem is that pharmacological treatment fail and now we will speak about the uh, uh, option, the endotherapy option that you can have. So the second question it, uh, is uh, what treatments may be useful um, to treat uh, GAVE? So uh, is it radiofrequency ablation, organ plasma coagulation, epinephrine injection, proton pump inhibitor or endoscopic band ligation? So I will let you uh, vote for that. You can have uh, more than one answer. Okay, so uh, you have 87% uh, of you that are going for organ plasma coagulation. It's very interesting because um, uh, you're right. It's the um, uh, first uh, endo, first line treatment of uh, this uh, affection. And um, uh, it was what we, we've done and I, um, uh, thank Jan because he gave me this video to illustrate the argon plasma application of um, GAVE. Uh, so you have the APC for argon plasma coagulation probe, and you can see that uh, we generally uh, begin uh, at the pillarus, and uh, after we go step by step uh, uh, for every lesion, and it's a non-contact a non -contact thermal uh, coagulation. So you don't have to put the probe uh, in the mucosa. You need to uh, have a few millimeter between the mucosa and the probe to make the electric arc with the iron as uh, argon, uh, argon uh, gas. So you need a, a, a specific probe and a specific uh, generator with uh, argon gas. And uh, what is frustrating in this technique is that uh, for every um, impact that you do, you treat two millimeters. So take your time. And uh, for the GAVE, it's not a five minutes gastroscopy. You have to take your time and to go step by step. So, uh, okay. So um, after the argon plasma coagulation, uh, we have 
uh, to change um, our mind because despite six sessions, the treatment failed and the patient uh, came every month for a transfusion. So uh, we decided to go for another treatment. Uh, the second line treatment that we used was the endoscopic band ligation. And uh, you can see also a video on this technique. Uh, you can see uh, that there are less um, uh, lesion of gave than before because the patient was already treated. Uh, here is the retrovision to uh, uh, see you that in the fundus there is no lesion uh, most of time. It's only, only in the uh, intron. So we put the uh, device for the band ligation you go uh, just right to the lesion, you uh, apply, apply the suction and you release uh, the band. It's really easy. It's like the, um, the same treatment as uh, esophageal varices. So I think you already did a lot and it's really easy. You have to uh, begin uh, on the pillarus and to go step by step uh, because when you put the first uh, band after it's difficult to go uh, further. So uh, begin uh, by the pillarus and uh, go uh, uh, to the rest of the end room. Um, uh, a good point is that it's a painful technique. So um, don't forget to give um, painkiller to the patient. It's more uh, uh, painful than APC. Um, so you can see uh, soon uh, the final view uh, of the video. Um, okay, so you can see all the the band. So if you if we look at the if we check the literature about uh, gave and the treatment, if we look at uh, endoscopic band ligation and uh, gave, you can see there is uh, an interesting uh, random mice control trial about 88 cirrhotic patients. They compare in this random mice control trial. A EB, EBL and APC every two weeks until the complete obliteration of the lesion. And this um, study clearly favors uh, endoscopic band ligation because uh, at the end you need fewer sessions of treatment and you have a less blood transfusion unit uh, needed. So maybe it's the, the preferred technique. Um, for uh, Madame M, it's okay, but I want you to uh, give you uh, also this um, case on uh, Gave, which is Monsieur V. is a 62 years old man. He's, he had he has a cirrhosis and recurrent melena. He was transfused every month, and uh, we failed with APC and endoscopic band ligation. So we decided to uh, treat him with uh, radiofrequency ablation. And I will uh, uh, give you this uh, video. I think you can see it. So you need a probe and you need a dedicated uh, generator for the uh, radiofrequency ablation that we named RFS. So we have a probe that go through, uh, grow into the channel. It's the channel probe. And you have a little hood to Put it inside. You have other prop for radiofrequency ablation, but I think this one is very easy to use for Gabe. You have the generator uh, generates two, uh, 12, sorry, 12 watts. And uh, here is the, the procedure. So you have the probe uh, in the walk-in channel through the scope and you have to apply the, the uh, probe on the mucosa. You also begin uh, at the pillarus, you have to put two impact uh, 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 without moving, uh, and you will see that it's uh, uh, a really uh, a really great treatment because you uh, comparing with APC, you treat a large area of the lesion, uh, and you. Um, you can see here uh, that you go step by step. It's a very nice uh, probe because you can move it really easily and you can also um, clean it like this. It's not really recommended by the firm, but I, I, I think that it's really easy to clean. You don't have to remove it in all the walk-in channel. So um, 
you put the, the probe to impact and it's, uh, I think, a really easy technique with very low complication rates. And I think it's really easy to perform. The problem is uh, it's a very expensive technique and generally used in the refractory cases. So uh, it was really good for our uh, patient because Monsieur V uh, had a drastic decrease in uh, the transfusion requirement and he stabilized his hemoglobin. And as you can see, before the treatment in um, 18 months, you have 22 units of RBC transfused. And after the two session for this patient, uh, only two units. So it was a very uh, interesting techniques and it came, uh, it don't came every month uh, after the, the treatment. So what the literature uh, is available, what literature is available for this technique, we have only um, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, uh, this article com uh, is a com compare the effectiveness and safety of RFR and APC in the treatment of GAP. It included 24 studies involving APC and nine studies involving RFR, but it was not comparative study. In, uh, it's important to note that in the total of the patient, 47% of them uh, who, um, who had RFR were refractory to previous treatment with APC. And what, we, what you can uh, see um, uh, is that the endoscopic success was better with RFA compared with APC. Uh, but uh, interestingly, the post-treatment pooled hemoglobin uh, increase and the reduction in transfusion dependence was higher for APC compared with RFA. So it's heter heterogeneous result, but Finally, RFA is probably a good uh, thing in refractory cases. Um, so to summarize, the endoscopic treatment of GAVES is based on the following principle, destruction of the gastric mucosa with abnormal vessels, respect of the gastric muscularis, but secondary, you need a repetilization of the gastric wall without the ectopic mucosal vessels. So the argon plasma is easy to perform. You need to have the generator with argon gas, but you need more session than for the band ligation and probably the RFI. So band ligation is easy to perform, low complication rate, and probably more efficient than APC, but maybe we need more data, but it's sometimes painful. For the RFA, it's very interesting, easy to perform, but you need uh, the material and it's a very costly equipment, uh, no, not always reimbursed. So uh, for the question I uh, asked you, the uh, free answer were radiofrequency ablation, argon plasma coagulation, and endoscopic band ligation. So now I want to uh, give you a little overview of other rare causes of non varicell upper GI bleeding. Very quickly with um, some uh, videos it's working here. Uh, I want to, sp to speak about uh, Diolafoy. Uh, Diolafoy is uh, an abnormal large torturous mucosal vessel that erodes the overlying epithelium uh, without primary ulceration or erosion. Normally, it's in the proximal stomach, in the great uh, curve, but sometimes you have uh, extra gastric sites and it's very challenging. Uh, um, uh, lesion. So um, the pathogenesis and the, the factor with Diolafoy are poorly understood. But what we know is that the mechanical endoscopic treatment is the best. Don't use epinephrine alone. And if you put a clip, uh, do a, a double or um, a, a, not, uh, the, a, a cap mounted clip. Uh, you, you can see uh, uh, here a clip or through the scope, but you can also put a cap mounted clip. It's uh, maybe uh, uh, better. So the, the second one in angioectasia, uh, you, you already know them, it's angiodysplasia uh, also. Uh, you, you know, you really um, 
know them well. It's malformed and some mucosal, uh, mucosal blood vessels. Normally you have multiple lesions in the small bowel, in the colon. You can see them uh, in the video capsule and the organ plasma are the first line treatment. The problem is the high risk of recurrence. So sometimes consider pharmacologic treatments if failed uh, uh, endoscopic treatment. Um, other one are Cameron ulcers. It's a very rare cause of non variceal upper GI bleeding. It's uh, occurred uh, often in elderly women with chronic anemia, and you always have uh, association with large yatal hernia. The PPR are sometimes useful. The, um, like the endoscopic therapy uh, can be useful, but uh, in many, many patients, finally, you will have to refer for surgery to treat the large uh, yatal hernia. Uh, I want to speak about autodigestive fistula. It's a very rare cause of non varicell upper GI bleeding, but a very life-threatening condition. And uh, you have to uh, think about it when you know that the patient um, had a vascular stent. Mostly it's in the duodenum and you have the fistula between the stent and the duodenum. And uh, what is difficult is that the average time between stage placement and the fistula is highly variable. So sometimes the stent was um, placed many years before. And in this case of very life threatening hemorrhage and you have the um, notion of uh, an aortic stent, please go to the angel uh, scan uh, uh, sometime before the upper GI bleeding, uh, the upper GI endoscopy, sorry. And finally, a very, very rare cause of uh, upper GI bleeding uh, is the bleeding from the papilla, uh, which came from the pancreas, with name Hemosuchus pancreaticus or Vinsungu, Vinsungu uh, regia or pseudohemobilia. Uh, most of time, most of times is a, a patient with chronic pancreatitis. So uh, you can see the bleeding like that uh, with the, the duodenoscopy. Uh, in uh, uh, it's a, a very nice case that I, I show you for the video, but sometimes you don't see it very well. But the this, this, the CT scan is very helpful because you have the diagnosis of the pan the chronic pan pancreatitis, and you have to perform an angio CT scan to see if there is a pseudo aneurysm because it's. Um, most of time the cause of the bleeding and the angiography or the surgery will be helpful. It can be also a pseudocyst. And immobilia, you have, uh, it's easier to uh, think about because you have a history of recent surgery, hepatic trauma or biliary drainage. The duodenoscopy can also uh, be useful and many times you will need the angio CT scan um, plus embolization for the treatment and it's very useful for etiologic diagnostic localization and, and the treatment. So it was a very quick uh, overview of all, not all, but most of um, the rare cause of non varicell upper GI bleeding. We have uh, very uh, little data uh, on the literature about uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, causes and the treatment that are the best, but we have to keep uh, this uh, diagnostic in your differential diagnosis. It's really important to think. And if you think of them, you will know how to find them. And finally, you will know how to treat them. So thank you very much. And I think you may have uh, some question now. So thank you, Maureen, uh, for the presentation. Now the, uh, you very clearly show us the relatively uh, not so common uh, sources of upper GI bleeding. However, they, they exist. I mean, and they are, uh, it depends on how big is your practice. If you have a big practice, then you encounter uh, circumstances like that. And uh, uh, the time is passing by. However, we have a lot of questions. So we will try to be very, very quick. 
with quick questions and quick answers. Okay. I yeah. have a question for you. You okay. recommend uh, uh, the cap mounting uh, clip uh, for this scared, uh, uh, the ulcers, the scary uh, ulcer, big scary ulcer bleeding. Uh, mm. is, is there any danger for a perforation? Listen, I, 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 we don't have enough data on, them, on the use of cap mounted clips in terms of, of perforations. I mean, I had a case once where I perforated a, an ulcer with a, with a through the scope clip. So my answer is theoretically yes. What, what I think what's nice about the cat mounted clips is that when it, with these large ulcers that are fibrotic is you can, you can either try and suction it or grasp it and pull it into the, into the cap. So we're more and more tending for those types of ulcers to use cat mounted clips, even though the data is limited. Okay, thank you. Maureen. Uh... What setting, what APC settings are you using uh, for the treatment of Dave? Oh, yes. Um, um, I use a forced APC. Um, you have um, a straight uh, probe. You can have a lateral probe or you have some, some different probe, but it's how you, um, it's your preference. But for the setting, it's forced APC. And generally, we are on 60 watt with organ flow of two liter per minute. Uh, I think it's it's the good setting, but um, maybe you you have another Yan. I'll use anywhere from 40 to 60, but mm -hmm. I'll also use a two liter flow. Mm -hmm. I think less than that, it's a little bit too weak. I was going to ask you: Have you used the the APC 360 probe? Because I have not. I've just no. used the straight probe. You have not either. No. Okay. So 360. So 360 is for, it, 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 in my opinion, it's very good in, uh, very easy to treat um, in radiation proctitis. So it, you can, uh, uh, it, it can shorten the time uh, to spend to, to, to treat the lesions. Have, have uh, you used it? Have you used it in GAVE at all? No, no, no. Not yet, okay. Not yet. And uh, thank you for highlighting the need to be a little bit ag aggressive in the settings of the APC when you're treating gastric vascular ectasia because people usually, that, I mean, there are some uh, of our colleagues that they're afraid of using these, uh, uh, these settings and they use uh, settings uh, uh, for, to, to treat lesions in the small bowel or in the large bowel. In, indeed, if you go below 40 watts or, an, or below two liters of flow, then the effect is not so good. I agree. Uh, another question we, for you, Ian. So you recommended the wide uh, gold probe. I, I, is there any any room for a smaller gold probe? Let's say, would you use a, a gold probe in the duodenal bulb or even in the second part of the duodenum? I, I, I always will use a therapeutic upper scope with a large size probe. I don't know of any comparative studies that looked at seven French versus 10 French, but I can tell you there were a couple of times I, I didn't have a 10 French and I had to use the seven French and it looked, it was like so small and I felt I wasn't able to tamp a knot adequately, the, 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 the surface area that I needed to. So I strongly recommend if you have a therapeutic scope, use a therapeutic scope in bleeding cases and use a large size contact thermal probe if that's what you're gonna choose. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Uh, Maureen, so if you have the patient with a uh, uh, GAVE again, and you perform uh, bond ligation, and then uh, what are the instructions that you do you give in the world? Or do you send the patient immediately at home uh, on which uh, kind of diet? Or do you give also PPIs or pethidine or whatever? Uh, generally, I, I gave them a painkiller because uh, it, it can be painful. Um, we uh, perform the... Um, uh, if uh, it's someone that he came for another session, a new session, uh, who, ha, um, who was already treated, uh, we do uh, in one day. He came uh, in the same day and he was discharged in the same day. But um, normally, when it was the first episode, they are hospitalized for the, the bleeding. So for the first station, generally, uh, we uh, keep them one night after. But we, you can perform it uh, only for one, one day uh, procedures, and we don't uh, give PPI. Marine, is, is there a maximum number of bands that you'll place? 
uh, generally we have a, a, a band ligation device with um, a seven band. So we put seven bands. Okay. Right. Um, at maximum. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, again, back to you, Ian. Uh, you use the cap mountain clip and erroneously and very mistakenly, you grab the pylorus. What's next? Yes. <laughs> um, I believe I've, I've, ne I've never done this and I, I don't remember. I, I thought there was a way that, that you can actually release. Uh, I don't know, Maureen, if you've had to do yes, that. I've not. I think there, there is, is a, a way that you can release device, the path. Yeah. There is a device that yes. exists to remove it, to cut it. Um, so, so I think you, you, if, uh, if uh, it's right, you, you, you can uh, change it. Yes. So, Maureen, uh, at what time intervals do you perform the APC treatment for the patients with GAVE? So mm -hmm. you have the patient once and when do you bring it back? It, it is, uh, uh, do you have a, a, a schedule or you follow him on his examination on his hemoglobin level or whatever? It, it, it depends, but um, when you perform the um, uh, first sessions, I think you have to schedule the other uh, session treatment and it's generally between two weeks and four weeks. In France, we do uh, four weeks because we want the um, mucosa to heal between sessions. And generally we uh, perform three sessions with scheduled session. And after we look at the patient, the hemoglobin and the results in the, the, critic, the clinical setting. We do the same thing. I agree with that completely. Yeah, I do. I do the same. And I am. Uh, is there any place for fibrin injection or even for APC treatment in peptic ulcer breathing? Well, so interestingly, uh, fibrin probably not. People are not really using it. There's some data on it, but it's very uncommonly used. Uh, the new ESG guidelines or the updated ESG guidelines on non-variceal bleeding will come out in the first quarter of 2021. And we actually, for the first time, there are some now data looking at the use of AP, APC and peptic ulcer bleeding. You can use that aside from contact thermal therapy. You can potentially use non-contact thermal therapy as part of combination with dilute epinephrine. But there's, again, there's not a lot of data on it. Uh, I know that people use it. It's not usually something that I use personally, but we are now making a weak recommendation about that. Right. And Maureen, uh, it, it's not an endoscopic tip and trick, but it's a uh, repeating questions that coming up from our attendees. Is there any role from, for pharmacological treatment in GAVE? Let's see. Propranolor, or even thalidomide, or even um, apostin, or even... I will say um, nothing. Nothing is really um, useful, but, but, but. Um, uh, you have a recent um, uh, article about uh, bevacizumab um, with a randomized control trial on GAVE and bevacizumab. And it seems that he, he, it had some uh, uh, great um, uh, success with um, almost 80% 80, 80 of patients who uh, need lesser transfusions. So maybe it's, it's, uh, it's a possibility, but I uh, never used it. And uh, maybe we need more, more data, but it's an option. Ian, what is, what is your experience in that? I personally give them as I don't in very extreme cases. I mean, you know, I, I really, we rarely give any type of pharmacologic therapy for that. Uh, oftentimes in these patients with GAVE, they also can have underlying renal disease or underlying liver disease. And that's sort of the problem is that you need to try and treat what, however, their underlying disease aside from the endoscopic therapy. So there's not there's not great options. I agree with uh, Maureen. And another question is probably our last question for both of you. Uh, although the guidelines recommend continuous infusion of PPIs 
at least after endoscopic treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, there is considerable uh, discussion and this, there is considerable controversy in that. So it, it, especially in clinical practice, sometimes it's very difficult to administer this uh, continuous scheme of PPIs. I mean, you, you need five vials of, of a PPI per 24 hours. How would you divide five vials by 24 hours? So it's difficult. So sometimes uh, in some uh, uh, facilities, they use the twice daily uh, PPI administration. So what is your personal experience on that? Ian? So, uh, and again, the guidelines that are gonna come out will reflect this. So we recommend that you you can give them the high dose IV PPI, 80 milligram bolus, eight milligrams an hour. I'm talking about after endoscopic hemostasis or for patients with a clot that you decided not to treat and you wanted to put them on pharmacotherapy. We are saying that it's okay to give high dose IV PPI twice daily bolus. So I would give them 80 milligrams twice daily. Okay. Or you can use uh, potentially high dose oral therapy if they're able to take that. The data on the oral therapy is not as good as the uh, twice daily bolus IV. Marie, what is your personal uh, We um, In France, we perform the IV infusions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't really have the um, experience of the um, fragmented PPI treatments twice a day. Uh, I, am, I know that there is not much evidence, but there are multiple questions on the topic. What about the poor stat? I mean, the use of this glue on the... The, the pure stat, as far as I know, and maybe somebody out there can correct me on this, but as far as I know, there's no data looking at pure stat specifically in peptic ulcer bleeding that I know of, okay? Pure stat basically has been used as a prophylactic therapy or in some bleeding after like ESD or EMR. So my personal belief is until we have actual data in peptic ulcer hemorrhage, I don't think there's a role for pure stat. Uh, and we didn't include pure, pure stat because of that reason in the, in the updated guidelines. I think it's, it's, I think it's interesting and I think I'd like to see data on it. But at this point, uh, you, can, you cannot make an analogy between uh, ESD bleeding and peptic ulcer bleeding. Yeah. And Maureen, you, you have, uh, now we have a patient which is a little bit more difficult. I mean, he has multiple art, uh, uh, malformation, uh, uh, arduvenous malformation in the duodenum, and he is on antithrombotic therapy. So he cannot stop antithrombotics. Let's say he has a metallic prosthetic valve. So, and he's bleeding. So what is your option for treating this patient? So he's on anticoagulant or anti-aggregation? It's anticoagulants. Mm. I think I, it's it's a tricky question. <laughs> oh, but we but um, we but we're gonna but we answered this. We gave guidance in the guideline. Marina. Yes, yes. So um, I don't remember all the guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can help me. So so, so, so I and R I and R yes. should not dictate when we do yeah. endoscopy or give or, Thank you. or provide endoscopic <laughs> hemostasis. And that's a, that's, a big, that's a big deal because you know, when I grew up, you had to wait for the INR to come down and you didn't want to do it. And that's no longer true. And there's actually data to show that even if it's like an INR of 2.5, you can do upper endoscopy and, and even perform endoscopic hemostasis. So you know, not doing early endoscopy, uh, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be stopped by doing early endoscopy because of, of the INR. Now, if it's some super therapeutic INR, whether it's five or six, you know, that's something you do need to deal with that and get it down somewhat. But it's not anymore that we need to wait till the INR is less than 1.5. Okay, so I and Maureen, uh, time has passed by. And it's time to uh, say goodbye to you and to our attendees and to remind them that the recording of this webinar will be posted on the e-learning section of the EAG site. And there they can find also our previous webinars. And I would like at this point to thank 
uh, uh, my team, Claire and Dave, and of course the EAG governing board. Uh, that means uh, I am myself and some others who give me the opportunity <laughs> to, 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 uh, to present this activity and check your time, check your calendar. Uh, Wednesday, uh, October 18, we have Imaging Alternatives to Colonoscopy, another uh, webinar. And of course, we are. this is one of the first announcements of EAG Days 2020. Uh, we decided to go uh, to, to, uh, to do this uh, uh, event virtually. And time is difficult, but EAG will be uh, at your side. So if endoscopy is your practice, EAG is your home. Thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you very much for having uh, both of you, Maureen and Ian, with us. It was a fantastic experience. Enjoy Thanks, the rest Dr. of the night. Au revoir. Thanks, Maureen. It was great. Thank, Thank you. It was Thank great. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe. Be well.